Fox News alert. The National Archives has just admitted that they have in their possession over 5,000 emails tied to Joe Biden's alias email accounts. Joe Biden, as vice president, used three different aliases. Robin Ware, Robert L. Peters, J.R.B. Ware. None of these are Biden's Secret Service code names. These are secret email accounts that Joe Biden was using to exchange covert messages with Hunter Biden, other Biden family members, friends, and staffers. And the persnickety librarians at the archives who were salivating to see Trump in prison over a paperwork dispute are stonewalling the release of over 5,000 secret Biden emails. They're saying sorting through the secret emails will take years. The National Archives, they have 3,000 employees. It takes less than 15 seconds to read an email, so you do the math, another cover-up. And Joe Biden's lawyers will have Sharpies, and they get to redact what they consider private or privileged. Hunter, I'm flying to Ukraine tomorrow. Call me about the prosecutor we were talking about. Zhut, redacted. There's a good chance we won't see most of these emails for years, which is why House Republicans need to open an impeachment inquiry immediately. So how do we find out about these secret emails? The laptop, obviously. Here's one from a White House staffer to Robert L. Peters, Joe Biden, CCing Hunter, quote, boss, 8.45 a.m. prep for 9 a.m. phone call with Ukrainian President Poroshenko. Then we're off to Rhode Island for infrastructure event and then Wilmington for UDEL commencement. So why was White House staff CCing Hunter about Vice President Joe Biden's phone call with the Ukrainian president? Why would Hunter need to know that? The owners of Burisma were squeezing Hunter Biden to call Washington to get help. Along this same time period, uh, we found a pseudonym where he copied Hunter Biden and uh, it would lead one to believe that this was Joe Biden's way of uh, copying Hunter Biden to say, OK, send it to the Burisma owners and tell them help is on the way. And five days later, Joe Biden flew to Ukraine to begin the process of firing the prosecutor. Hunter was also using his dad's secret email address to get his cronies government jobs. Here's one. Before you fill the position, please talk to me. McGrail very much wants to serve as detail for Treasury. Joe Biden's alias responds, call me right away. <laughs> Don't worry. The crony got the job. There could even be as many as six Biden alias email accounts. One of his personal favorites, 67 Stingray. You know the car that he almost lost in the kitchen fire that almost killed his cat? That one. And the same time Joe Biden was using secret e alias email accounts to talk business with Hunter, Joe Biden was flying Hunter to at least 15 other countries on Air Force Two. We paid for that. Countries where Hunter conducted business. What do you call secret flights, secret email addresses, burner phones, shell companies, offshore accounts, client dinners and phone calls, 150 suspicious activity reports, and $20 million of foreign money funneled into 10 different Biden family bank accounts? Well, a Biden business partner called it selling the Biden brand. And the White House won't say whether it's still happening. We know that uh, from a Hunter Biden associate now that he sold the appearance of access to then Vice President Biden. Are you confident that he has stopped doing that? That is a question for Hunter Biden. If somebody is selling the appearance of access that to the is, White House, that, that is, is a question for the White House. No, that is that is your, um, your I don't know, how you're perceiving that. that. Devin Archer talks about how he and Hunter Biden tried to profit off the Biden brand. What is the Biden brand? I'm not going to get into it from here. I'm not going to get into it from here. We're going to move on. So the White House isn't going to get into whether the White House is for sale. Got it. Jonathan Turley is a George Washington law professor and a Fox News contributor. All right, so, Professor, when someone is conducting business in secret, then getting caught and then lying about it, does that make you more or less suspicious? <laughs> well, there's plenty of reason to be suspicious, including the fact that the president appears to have been lying uh, to the American people, even during the presidential campaign. Even the Washington Post has said that it's untrue what the president has said, that indeed his son made money in China. And we also know that Joe Biden was aware of these dealings. And one of the things that Archer said after his interview with Congress was that it was patently false that Joe Biden didn't know about their business. 
And you also see a change in the media. Now the media is willing to accept that, indeed, Hunter Biden was running an influence peddling operation. Uh, but they insist that he was just selling the illusion of influence and access. Well, how do we know that? Do you just assume that? These emails go, could go a long way to determining what was a deliverable and whether it went beyond an illusion. Well, wealthy foreign nationals don't usually continue to pay millions of dollars over eight years for an illusion. <laughs> it's usually not how businessmen make all of those millions of dollars. I want to play some new sound from MSNBC. There seems to be a new conspiracy theory that we've put our finger on. Listen to Rachel Maddow. The election means one of two things, if this is the way he's going to approach it. Either he loses the election and he goes to prison. Or he wins the election, he doesn't go to prison, and is that for life? That he gets to be president? Will we keep having more elections or no? If every election is a new opportunity for him to go to prison, do you think he allows us to have new elections? So as a preeminent constitutional scholar, <laughs> do you see any warning signs that if Donald Trump is reelected, we're canceling future elections until eternity? Well, what's bizarre about that clip uh, is that there is, of course, other options. One is that Trump could be acquitted. You could have a hung jury. The cases could be thrown out on constitutional grounds. All of those at least are options that are worth mentioning for appearance's sake if you're a nation committed to the rule of law. Now, what is also missing in all of this is this lack of faith in our system. You know, we did have a terrible, terrible attack on the Capitol on January 6, but the system worked. The courts remained firm uh, all the way up to the certification and afterwards. Our system held together. And I always find it strange, this crisis of faith that people have. We have a fantastic constitutional system in this country. We've been through a lot. And so having that type of hyperbolic language is not helping. I mean, we, we need to remain unified in the common article of faith that we have, which is the Constitution. And that system has worked and will continue to work. If Donald Trump is convicted of any of these charges in court and his appeals are exhausted, do you see any possibility that a judge in the United States is going to throw a former president who's probably going to be 80 years old in prison? Well, it depends on the crime and it also uh, um, depends on the timing. President Trump could indeed pardon himself for federal crimes. For the state crimes, uh, it could create some serious complications. Uh, the court would first have to sentence him to jail, but then federal courts may get involved to the extent that that would interfere with presidential functions. We obviously have not been down that road, uh, but we have to look towards it. Uh, and it's going to be it's going to be a messy situation. The courts are going to have to deal with it. Uh, but there's a lot of road between now and and then. I mean, we're, we it's still not clear what trials could occur before the election. Uh, it's also not clear if convictions uh, that were secured would be upheld uh, when they're challenged. Uh, it, it probably is going to be difficult to bring all of these threshold challenges to the Court of Appeals uh, before trial. Judges tend to say that you should get a verdict first uh, and then appeal. Uh, but there are substantial constitutional questions that still have to be worked out. So uh, all the hyperbolic language uh, aside, there's a lot of constitutional legal questions that have to be resolved before we reach that point. All right, Professor, thank you for going to law school so I didn't have to. <laughs> thank you, Jesse. Hey, Sean Hannity here. Hey, click here to subscribe to Fox News' YouTube page and catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis. You will not get it anywhere else.